What's up guys, welcome back to another video. Today, Ted and I are visiting Northern Missouri for a turkey research project. If you guys have been following along with us over the last couple years, you know that we've been getting increasingly concerned about declining turkey populations and trying to help fund research in different parts of the country. We've done a lot of work with Dr. Chamberlain down in the southeast, and we're going to visit him next week. But today, we're gonna to meet up with the Missouri Department of Conservation and some students and professors from MU. They're studying poult survival. They're also studying nest predators and their effects on little turkey poults. I'm gonna go grab Ted and we're gonna head up here, meet these folks. I think that'll work. That'll work. All right, guys, we came down in the woods, get out of the wind a little bit. We are here with the professionals who are heading up all this research here in Northern Missouri. And CJ and Alicia, you two are PhD students at MU, mm -hmm. right? And they work with you, Mike. Yep. So you're the assistant professor. Yep, assistant professor of wildlife ecology at the University of Missouri. Gotcha. And Raina, what is your title at MDC? Um, wild turkey and rough grouse biologist is kind of what I use because I cover both species. Sweet. And this is like a big collaborative effort between MDC, MU, and uh, NWTF. Correct, yeah. So the project kind of started as a brainchild between our old turkey biologists and a previous professor at, at MU, and then Mike came in and kind of participated in the development of the research proposal. And then when I started my job here, kind of picked it up and got the project idea formulated and secured most of the funding. And NWTF came in as a really good partner, wanting to support the research as well with some of their resources too. So it's kind of how it all came about. So what on a high level are we doing with this project? We are trying to understand which factors most influence wild turkey reproductive success on this landscape at a broad scale. So we are trying to look at as much of the ecosystem things that might be influencing production as possible. We're looking at predator abundance and habitat use. We're looking at things related to weather and climate. We're looking at things related to habitat and landscape. Arthropod abundance, food availability for pulse. We're kind of putting that into a big stew to see, okay, what are the things that really might influence production in a given year in terms of nest success and pulp survival, and what are the things that we can manage for and hopefully optimize. Okay, and the, the main reason that y'all are doing this research, correct me if I'm wrong, is because we've got pretty significant declines for a lengthy period of time now. Right, so yeah, turkey abundance in Missouri hit its peak in the early to mid 2000s. Um, and then we saw some pretty steep declines, especially up here in North Missouri during the latter half of the 2000s. And we believe kind of what's been driving that is we've been seeing this really long-term decline in productivity over the last few decades. We've been doing our summer brood survey since the late 1960s. And so we have a pretty good index of what production is year to year for a long time now. And we're trying to basically figure out what's driving that. Um, there was another project up here led by our previous turkey biologists that looked at like survival, harvest rates, um, reproductive parameters for turkeys. And what we really found from that was survival looked good, harvest rates seemed sustainable given current trends, but some of our productivity metrics, things like poult survival especially, but also a little bit nest success, were a lot lower than they were several decades ago. And so trying to parse out, you know, why are those the way they are now? Um, that project wasn't really designed to, to get to the why, it was just to get a screen like a little bit of a snapshot of what was happening, but not necessarily why. And so we designed this project to kind of figure out what's yeah. driving that decline in poult survival that we've seen. Yeah. So yeah. we're not making enough turkeys. It's yeah. pretty much making the gist fewer of it. turkeys. Making fewer turkeys. <laughs> making yeah. fewer turkeys. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they tend to be driven, you know, a lot of game birds and things are really driven by production booms from year to year. That's what drives their abundance. And mm -hmm. so seeing that decline in productivity has led to abundance declines across most much of the state. So sure big thing is the pulp mortality. What are the major factors affecting that, I guess? That's a great question that hopefully we can answer. If, if pulp right. dies and we can get to where the hole was, we can hopefully figure out, was it a predation event? Did it die of starvation, disease? You know, what might have caused the death? Right. Yeah. And then, you know, quantify that. And then, you know, that's a useful information to know from a management perspective, you know. Yeah, so we're, we're, gonna, we're gathering so much information. We're, we're gonna answer the questions of, that are the original objectives, but we're going to have a lot of information to answer sort of ancillary things that, you know, might not have been the main ideas, but we'll be able to look at things like roost habitat selection, um, 
roost habitat selection for broods before they can fly. You know, maybe what's important for that, because that could be really important to brood survival as well. And how many days before they can fly? About 14 days, kind of that first two weeks, you know, yeah, when they're, when they're right, roosting on the ground, what, what are they using, you know, for roosting habitat? Sure. Uh, we'll be able to, as we kind of mentioned, we'll be able to quantify juvenile dispersal, which is an interesting thing that isn't like super well quantified very often, but that first year, how far do the juveniles go to where they nest, you know, what is that dispersal distance? Uh, if we get broods over, if we get individuals over multiple years, we can look at things like fidelity to nest sites. The individual birds go back to the same nest area to nest every year. Are they successful continuously? Are some hens really good at being successful? Do some hens flail around? Right. So it's kind of all this ancillary stuff we'll learn, and not to mention all the stuff we'll learn about, like, the mammalians, just the ecology of the mammalian predators, you know, on top of right. it as well. But Occupancy so. probability of different predators across the county and different landscape types. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, from perspective, their interactions and what's their habitat mm -hmm. use. And so it sounds like you got a lot of irons in the fire on this one. It's a lot like of stuff. It's, it's a big project. It's, there's a lot going on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we just talk about how we're keeping track of the hens first. Like, yeah. how do we go about that? Yeah. Because that's what you guys have been doing a bunch lately, right? Mm -hmm. Have you all been trying to trap mm -hmm. birds? Yep, so our project has four field seasons that run January through August. And in January through approximately March of each year, we try to capture 50 wild turkey hens and fit them with backpacks. And these backpacks have three different capabilities. GPS, so they can take GPS locations at whatever interval we program them to. Um, an accelerometer. And this measures movement in three dimensions so that we can attribute behavior to hens in the field. And then UHF, which is how we actually find the hens. Right. That's basically a pinger that we can pick up. And then we can remotely download the data that is collected by the backpack and look at that. So we, they can individually fit those to each hen based on her body size and everything to make sure she can move still really well without, you know, um, the transmitter falling off because it's too loose. And sort of okay. the really cool thing about those units is we can get really f fine scale information on how they're moving. And so we can get fine scale information on what habitats they're using. We can nail down exactly when they start to incubate a nest, when the nest might have failed. We get GPS locations, you know, at some times of the year, every 10 minutes. Um, and with the accelerometry, we can actually assign behaviors. So we can follow a hen around and say, okay, when she was in this type of habitat, she was walking or she was pecking or she was sitting down. So we can- Oh, that's very interesting that then. Stuff. Yep. Yeah, we also did some work before the study to get at that movement threshold of when she's just kind of, when she starts moving a little bit more. So when she's incubating, mm -hmm. we can, when the, the transmitter picks up more movement with that accelerometer, it'll start taking GPS data points more frequently. Mm -hmm. So like when she's on the nest, it doesn't take points very frequently because mm -hmm. she's in one place. And that's how you know she, she's on. A yeah. nest because she's just sitting well she's either right yeah you can dead activity or level goes yeah. down to nothing right. yeah and then we've actually got it set because one of the questions that's come up in recent years from other research has been what is the role of hen behavior during mm -hmm. nesting yeah and success you know the hens that take more frequent recesses have you know better or worse nest success than mm -hmm. others so with these tags we can really drill down on that so during the nesting season when she's incubating when she's just sitting there it takes location every six hours because you don't need a ton of them as soon as she gets up and walks around we start getting a location every minute so oh, we wow. can see when they come mm -hmm. off the nest where exactly do they go how far do they go how far do they stay off the nest every <laughs> minute there's a burst of 10 locations every 10 seconds nice oh interesting yeah. so you could yeah. learn all kinds of interesting <laughs> stuff yeah. from that really yeah. endless like how they're how they their habitat use changes throughout the course mm -hmm. of the spring and all those things right yeah. so one of the big things we're getting at is what is brood habitat mm -hmm. so once we get into the brood rearing season you know we'll move to getting location every 10 minutes add that to what we learned from the accelerometer in terms of what the hens are doing we can really drill down to well not just what habitats do they use but what are they selecting for and how are they using different types of habitats mm -hmm. right right so, okay this is the habitat they use for foraging this is the habitat they use for resting this is the habitat they use for traveling you know and then once you figure that out, we as land managers can figure right. out what we need to do. Well, we yeah. can correlate that to the poult survival. Right. So if, well. if, that, if the poult survived well based on what that hen did, then we'll try to figure out, okay, what did that hen do that led to those poults surviving? That makes That's sense. really when we can drill into, okay, this is what that habitat looked like. 
she had these resources within this small area she didn't have to move them you know those sorts of things and um, kind of get at how we might manage the landscape to improve pole survival because that's ultimately the goal here that's so. awesome that's a lot of hens too how many hens total was the plan like every year to 50, 50 hens per year, year. and mm -hmm. it's a five year four four year okay yep and that's just so with any study you know your weather patterns are going to be a little bit different one year right. might be wetter one year might be drier so you can um, get some variability in those climate variables from year to year to look mm -hmm. at the impacts of weather and we've got a pretty warm winter so far this winter right. you know how might that impact <laughs> nest success this year compared to yeah. uh, maybe next year it's super cold or last right. year was Hens really might cold. go into nesting in really good body condition this year <laughs> yeah. yeah but to your point a while ago that's kind of the point of this whole uh, project is yep. to bring all those mm -hmm. factors in to one pot and kind of figure out what's going on because yep. right. as you know as turkey hunters we look at one thing and we're like you know oh it's the lack of trapping or oh it's too much fescue or whatever it is and we we try to you know on our online you know battles between one another if you will <laughs> we try to all nail down what the smoking gun is right yeah. but in the, reality it's probably not a single smoking right it could be a mix of different things and in some years some things might be important than other things it could be intrinsic just population level density dependent sort of effects you know so it's trying to what are the component parts and when is one thing important and which things should we concentrate on right. or which things should we you know maybe not concentrate as much on as on. much and waste resources on right well, and yeah. obviously we can't control certain things like we're not going to be able to make more rain one year or less rain yeah. another year but if we find a certain habitat structure is really good at buffering the hens and their nests and the poults from that bad weather then that's something that would obviously help us inform management because obviously sure. there's some things that are beyond our control but we're looking at how do those interact with things that we have a little bit more control over what is the stage of this project year two yeah is that right yeah you got two more years of this after this spring correct talk to us about what y'all are doing like on a detail level as far as how you're going out and you're tracking all this information how are you keeping track of all this stuff very carefully. Um, <laughs> so right now um, it is about March and we have been tracking last year's hens that were trapped last year. Okay. So we're also uh, going to try and track our new hens or trying to trap new hens. From January to roughly the end of March, that's what we are pretty much solely doing is we're tracking last year's hens. We're trying to find as many as we can both to target them to be able to recapture them for um, to replace the backpacks okay but also just to know where they are so we can download data from hens over the summer and over the fall the we don't track them from uh, August to December and so we want to get that data as much as we can sure. so we've been trying to do that and then when it's not 70 degrees almost um, <laughs> we will be in the blind, rocket nets set out to hopefully capture new hens as well in different sites across the county. Nice. I bet that's pretty exciting. When it, <laughs> when you got turkeys coming in, I'm assuming. Well, I was say, <laughs> it's a lot of not exciting. Not exciting. <laughs> yeah. it's and a little bit of exciting. A lot yeah. of hurry up and wait. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. One thing that might be worth building on, just as CJ mentions, they're tracking birds from last year. These units, this is the first time we're using these new types of units but mm -hmm. their battery power is pretty impressive and so we've still got what 30 36 birds alive 39 i think that we have now 39 mm -hmm. that are still alive from last year mm -hmm. so assuming those batteries last into the nesting season one cool thing about this project is we're going to get potentially multiple years of data on individual birds which could be really interesting to see you know are there some birds that are just really good at creating more turkeys right, right. right. you know and, and something that's really interesting is one of the hens that we tagged last year dispersed like nine miles and oh, then she yeah. came back. And really? so really nobody anticipated she would come back. And so yeah. Cause we'll she be was interested. Because she was a juvenile hen last year. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. so we'll be interested to see where she goes this year <laughs> to yeah. nest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah normally the juvenil juveniles will disperse to their new spot and then they kind of stay in that area. It's rare for them to like make that juvenile dispersal the other direction back to where they came from. Right. <laughs> so obviously we're looking at reproduction here. So that's obviously why we're targeting right. hens. But um, I just wanted to say like thinking, looking at how many survived from last year just goes to show 
kind of what we found in the last study where their survival when they reach that age is yeah, really point, good ago, like, it's like once yeah. they right. get once they make right. it through polthood if you will yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. they're in pretty good they, shape right exactly yeah. and that just goes to show how many survived the year and we've only had five mortalities during Very reproduction few. last year it was yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a straight off between if you're an adult hen, do you prioritize your survival to try to guess nest another year or mm -hmm. do you really stick with it and you know risk getting killed yourself? It's actually interesting that some of our birds were from the, like we have some birds that are at least five or seven years old, right? Really? That's right. Yeah. So last year we tagged 51 hens mm -hmm. and one of them was seven years old and the two at of at them, least, at least seven, seven years old yeah. and uh, two of them were five years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, that we say at least because she was originally banded as an adult, so we don't know exactly how old she was. The five-year-olds, though, were banded as juveniles, so we know exactly what year they were hatched. Wow. Yeah, but yeah, so to see those birds still surviving from the last study was really interesting. I mean, some of them can live quite a while, so they, we might find those birds prioritize their survival and maybe not <laughs> producing a nest. I don't know. <laughs> well, think about it. Each, each one of those, as long as they're successful just once or twice in their life, that's enough to sustain a population, potentially. Sure. So. Yeah, the goal is to like replace yourself through the course of your life so yeah. you don't have to be success successful every year if you live multiple years. One of the other things you're monitoring that I found super interesting is uh, like nest predators. There's mm -hmm. a more, what's the, what's the term? Meso? Mesocarnivore. Mesocarnivore. Meso That's raccoons, possums, skunks. Uh, skunks. What I'm do y'all? Pretty much anything coyote and smaller okay. kind of falls into that. What are you guys doing with those? There's kind of two categories, right? We have our nest predators, and then you have your brood predators. Okay. And nest predators would be like raccoons, skunks, possums. And so in the spring, we're supposed to start now in March, um, we live trap these animals and fit them with an ear tag and a pit tag, which a pit tag is like a microchip you'd give your dog or your cat so that you can identify them. Oh. And then uh, if we recapture any of those individuals, because we can identify them, we can estimate how many are in the county and then relate that to nest success. Okay. And so that's kind of my baby and CJ does the brood predators. And so the brood predators are basically coyote and uh, coyote, bobcat, fox are what we're really specifically looking at. Um, but with that, what we're doing is we have 50 game cameras that we're putting out on static points across the county. And that's to get an idea of presence versus absence. So are there coyotes in a certain area versus not? And it comes around to the idea of behind when a turkey has a brood, is she more likely to, if she takes her brood into a certain area, will she be more likely to come across a bobcat or a coyote or a fox or all three or maybe none? Mm -hmm. And can we equate that to their survival to see if they interact with one another? That's a really interesting portion of it because obviously a lot of people have questions regarding, you know, especially like nest predators. I've seen more of that this past three or four months like more people getting involved in trapping and we know that they obviously play a part but I, that's why I'm really interested in this study is because you, you're baking that in with every with all of these other factors right. yeah. and yeah. trying to learn more about everything as a whole because yeah. so to pull, like a lot of people will jump on a thing like okay it's it's the predators and so if we just get rid of all the raccoons suddenly nest success will go through the roof which mm -hmm. right might be true but might not necessarily be true you had to factor in the weather, the habitat conditions, the behavior of the hens, all these other factors that might play a role, you know, and so it might turn out that, you know, predators are, they seem obvious, but maybe they're not a huge part of it. Maybe it's something else and then predators are a smaller part, right? So right. it's important to tease these out before you start making management decisions in those. One cool thing we're doing that hasn't been done much before in terms of the pult aspect of things is trying to quantify arthropod abundance so if you know you know arthropods little insects are really important to pults during those first few weeks of life they need to get protein to, to grow fast so in terms of pult survival a question that hasn't been addressed super specifically is well what's the forage availability and how might that influence things you know maybe pult survival is related to you know a lack of insect availability sure so one of the things we're doing over the summer is along with vegetation and all these things trying to quantify what is the biomass of arthropods in different habitat types and where do the birds go and you know are they using 
areas with lots of arthropods or in places like agricultural fields does arthropod biomass you know decreased and what role does that potentially play so what's an arthropod arthropod is uh, anything small with an exoskeleton basically so spider bugs beetles okay. all that stuff that a pulp might grasshoppers, grasshoppers. That's what i was thinking yeah the big one yeah. And so yeah we can look at where the hens with the broods are taking their their broods around because you're monitoring that so frequently with the GPS's and their movements and their behaviors, yeah. right? And then we can look at, okay, what's what's the food availability in those areas and kind of correlate those things together. That's real interesting. So how do you guys, how do you guys know like what stage she's in of the nest cycle or if she's, if she's failed or if the nest has been predated upon or any of that stuff? Right, so hens should start nesting sometime in April. So in the beginning of April, we monitor their locations as close to daily as possible. And then when we hear with the UHF that she's in one location for more than a, a day, we'll say like two days in a row, we hear she's in like the same location, then we'll go in um, and walk into the nest and try not to flush her and basically flag a circle around the nest so that we can find it. And we continue to monitor with the GPS and the accelerometer data for nest failure, essentially. And if a nest fails, then we'll go in and try and figure out what happened. So, okay. so how like, do you know if it fails? Will she just, will she leave yeah. too soon or something? Yeah, so if it's basically before 28 days, which is the expected hatch length or incubation length, then we'll go in and see what happened. If like the nest bowl is there and the eggs are whole and she probably abandoned it. If they're smashed and strewn out everywhere, then a predator probably got it. If it was to be at like the 26 day mark, maybe they just hatched a little early and you can tell if an egg was hatched or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, you oh, you can. Yeah. You can tell the difference between a hatched egg and a predated mm -hmm. nest, yeah. if you will. I don't know how to explain that very well. It's kind of like I someone can. popped yeah. the top off. Really? Yeah, like when they yeah. hatch, the top yeah. just pops off? You think about like a chicken egg, it might be like the bottom, like the way that's like the pointier end and then the flatter end. That right. flatter end will have like just a little like like the chick on the inside just pecked, pop, it, pecked out. it out and then yeah, pop the top off and then Roll comes out. out. Yeah. So yeah, if you have intact membranes like that that look like they just have a little circle cut out of them that can tell you that that was a, a successful nest and if they're sitting in the same spot or close together yeah well sometimes you get predators that come in even after like i've come up on a successful oh, okay. nest where maybe it looks like something got there before i did and kind of threw some of the eggs out yeah. so i yeah there can be a little bit just bit, bit of disturbance but for the most part yeah they'll just be sitting there in the nest bowl some of them might not have hatched, so then you can look at, okay, the total clutch size was 11, but only nine of them actually made it out of the egg, and okay. there might be whole eggs there. I've come up on that quite a bit, so yeah. So what are you looking for after she hatches a successful nest then? Are right. you following oh. the clutch then? <laughs> this is the <a> fun part. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to talk about the vegetation surveys, or yeah. do you want to talk I'm about, about the, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, so regardless if a nest was successful or not, we conduct vegetation surveys at the site. And so basically what we're doing is uh, at the nest bowl, we're trying to look at like how much grass is there, or how many shrubs and what percentage of ground cover are these things, right? So we have a PVC rectangle that we put on the ground and it's a meter by meter. Okay. And using that, we estimate like this percent of the ground within this rectangle is grass or this percent is shrubs or oh, that's interesting. this percent is bare ground or litter. Um, litter would be like dead plant material. And then we also have what's called a robel pole. And this is a pole, it's like one and a half meters tall. And we can use this to see from like five meters away how low can you see into the ground, right? Okay. So if it's really dense vegetation, like thick grass, you're not going to be able to see as far down as if it was like mowed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can see where that would be really good information, too. And then the last thing we look at is uh, canopy cover. So we have this thing that's actually like a mirror that we can look at and see what percentage is open above right for like avian predators 
Okay. So you can see down into the nest. So, a lot like, of information coming yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of information coming in. That's, that's before cool. we start using, you know, fancy computer programs to look at, uh, you know, forest cover and land types and distances to roads and trails yeah. and yeah. 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 all that stuff. This is, yeah, what we call like the micro habitat conditions around the nest bowl. Uh -huh. um, and then we obviously, yeah, look at all those larger landscape level things, the patch sizes of different of the field she's in, how close she is to a road, to an edge, you know, all of that stuff can be taken into account right. too. So you guys are also monitoring the pulse afterwards. Yeah, so what we um, will be doing is once the pulse have hatched, um, within 24 to 48 hours of the hatch time, we will attempt to basically catch the pulse. And in order to do that, we go in before sunrise and one person will get an idea using our uh, UHF frequencies, so the pingers that are on the hen, get an idea of where she is. And before sunrise, they're on their roost location, so she's gonna more than likely have her brood in a single spot. So once we can narrow that down, the idea is that we have our crew surround the hen as close to as we can until she flushes. Once she flushes, it's kind of an all hands on deck moment of going in and scooping up the pulse. We'll then um, keep them in a little bit of a, a cooler to keep them a bit warmer. Um, right. And then we are putting pulse transmitters on them, which are about yay big. And they are sewn on to the back of the pulse. And these are actually VHF, which differ from our hen pingers because VHF, you don't have the um, download capacity that you do with a UHF signal. Okay. So these will be um, something that our team will then go out and each pult we will track daily up to 28 to 30 days. Is that like your really sensitive time period that you're wanting to that look at? That is a very sensitive time okay. period. So pults themselves are, the first seven days are probably the most sensitive because they're at their smallest. And like we were talking about with all the vegetation, with the density, I mean, anything can be a mountain to a pult. Right. So they may have a pult that can't get through something and can't get away from a predator or something along those lines. Once they start to get older, and they start to be able to move around in different landscape, they can move a little faster. At 14 days, usually they can fly and flush. So then their survival starts to increase as it goes on. But that first seven days is probably the most crucial, but we monitor up to 30 for just the, that month is the most like time that they're probably going to get eaten. Everything is so carefully done, literally every step of the process. Like you guys didn't just come up with an idea to do this turkey research and just ran out here and started doing it. I mean, when I read through all of that stuff that y'all sent, it's like there is so many studies that are referenced before this. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's like dozens and dozens of studies over the last, what, 30 or 40 years yeah. that you just, and it's just constant building blocks all the time. Like you said, the you started with VHF and now you're using GPS. The technology yeah. improves, we can learn more. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting too. And man, I would have killed to have GPS transmitters on some of the birds I was tracking because I'd lose them for a couple weeks and I'd oh, find yeah. them like 30 miles away. Oh, wow. That's in South Dakota though, it's real <laughs> spread out up there. But like, yeah. I was like, man, what I wouldn't give to know what path you took to get out here, you know? Whereas these birds, we can get a better idea of like what landscape features are they actually using as those travel corridors or I don't know, it's really, really interesting Yeah, like stuff. when I was doing my work, I, you know, I'd be able to get like one location a day, you know. If I was oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd have to drive around to find each bird and triangulate the location. And, you know, with these things, like we said, we can, sometimes of the year we're getting, like during the brood rearing season, we get a location every 10 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. just the, the wealth of information just blows up at that point. Sure. And with this particular project, uh, this is all taking place in this county. Well, we yeah. trap in Putnam County, and then the birds decide where they want the study to go after that. <laughs> okay, so they some of them some of them move out, and yeah. you know. Yeah. But are you doing this on like multiple sites within the county? We're doing this on primarily um, private land. Okay. So we have we're working with over um, eighty, I think actually it's over ninety private landowner now now that wow. are 
helping us out. They're allowing us to trap on their land. They're allowing us to go in and track our birds if we need to. Some are just giving us great information on where they're seeing birds. We're getting stopped on the side of the road and saying, hey, we know who you guys are. We've kind of made our face and know who you guys are. Hey, we saw some hens in this field just a couple miles over if you guys want to trap. Oh, by the way, that's my brother's cousin. Like, here's his number. But we're getting all of this great support from these landowners. And that's so that's primarily what we're working on. We have a little bit on public land. There's a few um, MDC conservation areas that we're working with but mostly we are on private land working with them. I like hearing that because I think that we're all kind of in the same boat here. That's the gist I get from traveling around the country and talking to, you know, land managers and turkey hunters and scientists and everything. It's like everybody loves the bird. Everybody is trying to help protect the future of the bird. We're all in this together, if you will. So it's nice to hear that, like as you guys are working throughout the county, that you've got all this cooperation. That gets me fired up about it because that gives me a lot of hope that we can figure a lot of these challenges out moving forward. Right. Yeah. Instead of like, especially here in some place like Putnam County, where like ni over 90% of the land is private, you know, we really yeah. live and die based on the cooperation of the landowners sure. that are For willing sure. to work with us. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Definitely appreciate. Oh yeah. E even yeah. just, hey, can we go track a mortality signal? Just right. access to go retrieve a transmitter. Even that is like really, really helpful. Right. Yeah. And they're sure. giving us insight every time we go out. We'll, we've got landowners who have other land managers working on them and they'll say, well, I was in walking in the woods the other day and there was a great roost section. And we're like, well, we're trying to catch turkeys. There's this field that we saw on your property. Can we like, do you think, have you seen these hens out in this field? And they're like, oh yes, that's, that's yeah. a great place to trap. And so we get all this information from them and it really is one of the best things about the project. So we've already talked about like uh, the nest predators and these other aspects like the arthropods. Arthropods. Science. Yeah, <laughs> science <laughs> is cool. Science. <laughs> but you guys are also measuring weather and how exactly are you doing that? So we have uh, 10 weather stations across Putnam County and these are put out in the late spring after uh, we're sure that the frost isn't going to mess with them and they are measuring precipitation and temperature for us and so that will allow us to get an idea of the precipitation and temperature for Putnam County itself from when we put them out to the end of the season. Sure. Yeah. More and detailed then, than we could get with just a single, singular like NOAA weather station. Right. Okay. And then you can mm -hmm. catch for variation across mm -hmm. the, the, the county, county as well. Yeah. Right. You can look back and see if that had any impact right. or whatever. On you know how patchy some of those summer storms can be. Oh, yeah. One part might get a bunch of rain. One part might be completely dry. And so it just allows us to get a more detailed picture of what's going on there for our models that we do to look at the effects of weather on yeah. nesting and whatnot. We put out these little things, they're called hogo loggers, that only measure temperature. And so that will measure temperature at the ground level. And so then CJ will be able to relate that to uh, brood success and habitat selection. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Get so, out like thermal refugia. Yeah, so at so. each of those points, <laughs> then the CJ will be doing, well, they'll be doing a lot of vegetation <laughs> surveys over the summer. <laughs> right. Is, uh, you know, we got these points, at each point we got temperature logger, and that's also what we're doing kind of vegetation and arthropod right abundancy so we'll have these spots where we can look at, at the same place at the same time food availability thermal refugia because you know a young pulse could be highly susceptible to really high temperatures or really cold temperatures for example and then vegetation characteristics so certain vegetation types might lead to different types of thermal refugia or have different food availability right so you can kind of get it all mm -hmm. that stuff all right well that's a lot of very interesting stuff hopefully you all got something out of it we really appreciate you guys taking the time to drive up and meet with us out here and like i said earlier i'm just real thankful for all of you we need to know this information it's very important to turkeys and turkey hunters well we'll great for to talk about it so yeah thanks for having us <laughs> yeah, yeah no problem see you guys later thanks for watching this video <laughs> Anybody want to clap to send it out? <laughs>